Tonight, I'm so excited to have the opportunity to talk with Jay Widener. Called by Wired Magazine an authority on the hermetic and alchemical traditions, Jay is a renowned filmmaker, author, and scholar. He's considered to be a modern-day Indiana Jones for his ongoing worldwide quest to find clues to mankind's spiritual destiny via ancient societies and artifacts. His body of work offers great insight into the circumstances that have led to the cur current global global crisis. He is writer, director of the feature film, The Last Avatar, director of the critically acclaimed documentary, Infinity, The Ultimate Trip, Journey Beyond Death, and writer, director of the documentary series on the work of Stanley Kubrick, Kubrick's Odyssey, and Beyond the Infinite, and much more. In 1996, Jay became one of the first employees of a startup company, you might have heard of it, called Gaim, for which he was the video production development director and he'll until he departed in 2000. In 2000, he founded Sacred Mysteries together with his wife, Sharon Rose. He's directed 15 films in the current Sacred Mysteries DVD collection, including The Last Avatar, Infinity, Secrets of Alchemy, Art Mind, Healing the Luminous Body, Quantum Astrology, Sophia Returning, and more. Since 2012, 12, excuse me, Jay developed and produced original content for Gaia TV, the online alternative network television for which he develops and produces cutting edge programs and series such as Cosmic Disclosure and Wisdom Teachers Teaching starring David Wilcock, Deep Space, a series about the secret space program, Beyond Belief with George Norrie, Open Minds with Regina Meredith, Hidden Origins with Michael Tellinger, Hollywood Decoded, which is a great show Jay himself is on and I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. For greater insight into his work, you can go to www.gaia.com backspace widener. And we have all this information down in the description below for you. And just a couple reminders before we start, if you have a question, please type it in all caps so that I can see it easier. And the Super Chat is open. Super Chat is a great way to support SOR on a nightly basis. We love to bring you interesting shows seven nights a week. That's right. Every single night we are here for you and we can't do that without your support. So we always appreciate your Super Chats. For those of you who are new to our channel, this is a live show. So we'll be taking a five minute break after the first hour. And welcome. We're happy to have you here. And for our loyal Spaced Out family, welcome back. Also, if you know anyone who enjoys a good conversation about well, kind of everything on this show, uh, go ahead and share the show with them right now so that they can join us. Also, if you haven't done it yet, please hit that subscribe button down below. Okay, let me get Jay onto the show for us. I am so excited to speak with him. Hi, Jay. Welcome to the show. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. I'm so, so excited to talk with you tonight. I think we're going to have a great conversation. But the first thing I want to start with, and it was in your bio, so let me go back because make sure I get this right because I want to make sure we know. <laughs> what is or what are hermetic and alchemical traditions? Well, um, unknown to most of the people that live in the Western world, uh, we actually have our own shamanic tradition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just like the Native Americans and the South Americans and the Africans and the Chinese and the Australians, well, we also have our own. And um, uh, I became very interested in, in, in our Western shamanic traditions back a long time ago. And we call that alchemy. And alchemy is this strange um, cocktail of um, shamanism and science, which, of course, we in the West love. We love science, right? And so what we've done with alchemy is we've taken intuitive um, knowledge and scientifically quantified it. And... Um, you know, scientists say that, you know, what we're doing is bunk and nonsense and all that because they don't have the, the deeper spiritual tradition that you're, you're going to need to understand how to transform the self uh, into a higher self, which is what shamanism does and what alchemy does. And so, um, you know, I'm happy to tell the world that um, even us Europeans and people of European descent actually have a shamanic tradition that goes back thousands of years, goes through the, the um, people that they called witches and the people that created potions and herbalists and, um, and, and the males who were, um, and female, because female uh, alchemists, alchemy was actually discovered by females. Uh, Isis the prophetess uh, was the first person human to understand alchemy and um, uh, Mary the Jewess was also uh, one of the people that brought the solid alchemy to the masses and it has a real 
a real thing to it. I mean, a real, my, uh, it, it, it has a purpose. And so if you look back in history and you, um, you know, you look back from say 2000 years ago to 200 years ago, you're going to see that, you know, in a time of no doctors, um, that people were still very healthy and they still lived a long time. If you got past the first five years of life, which of course was really tough in those days, but what they had was they had this white powder, which they called the passion cake. And they believed, of course, it came from Jesus. And Jesus is an alchemical tradition also, which I can get into if you want. But this passion cake was a white powder and you flaked it onto your tongue whenever you felt sick and you got better. And this passion cake was created by the alchemists. It's their white gold. And it was very difficult to create. And the alchemists did it for the people. They created this passion cake so that people would get healthy. And they also built the cathedrals in Europe, the Gothic cathedrals. And they didn't build those as edifices to worship a god or a savior, although later they were used as that. The original purposes of the cathedrals, which were built and designed by the alchemists, by the shamanic people of Europe, was to create a edifice of healing, of perfect geometry and perfect acoustics. So when the organ played and the choir sang the Gregorian chants and you walk the labyrinth, which is on the bottom floor of every cathedral, not now, but used to be, I think Shark Cathedral still has its labyrinth. You walked within the healing telluric energies that were coming down from the steeples of the cathedral down onto the granite floor and spreading and then spreading out from the cathedral out into the town that surrounded the cathedral. And if you consider, if you consider Europe before 1000 AD, um, you find a frankly wretched, poor, unlearned, illiterate people. But if you look at Europe at 1300 AD, after that, after 300 years of cathedral building, you find a people that are on their way to the Renaissance, on their way to the Reformation, people who are highly acute of sacred geometry and, and what these powers were. And, and of course, we've lost that when, when the mini ice age hit in 1300 and threw us into freezing cold and we had just had to survive and, and we lost that tradition which is you know, one of the things I'm trying to do is bring back that ancient European tradition because it's really exciting and really powerful. And, and I hope I haven't given too long an answer there, but that's sort of what it is. And we no, can get into amazing. the details. That's amazing. I love it. So say someone is coming to you and they're saying, okay, how do we start about learning about this tradition? What's the best place for them to kind of start off beginning shamanism european shamanism 101 um hmm, this is a good, really really good question um i would guess you know the the problem is is that if, if you if you have the time and the brain power to study the books that were left behind the rosicrucian books and the alchemical manuals uh you can you can find out a lot but they're very difficult to read they're very dense and very difficult. And, you know, I'll spend a year reading one book over and over until I finally get it. And so that's not really going to work. So what you really want to do is you want to commune with nature. That's the first and fastest way to achieve the balance, the spiritual balance that you really need. And so I highly recommend a walk in the woods as much as you can. Uh, interacting with the animals and the uh, the plants, and even practicing plant medicine. There's many things that aren't psychedelic. I'm not saying psychedelic, although psychedelics do help, but there are many plant medicines that you can take that will help you get in touch with this and um, also um, create a sacred space within your own dwelling. That's because we're living in such an insane world right now that it's really important that you have a place that's completely dedicated to your spiritual practice, which is, you know, I have like 
orgone pyramids and candles and you know i'm doing incense and and i've got a place that's just like completely built up for this uh wall of protection to help me cope with the insanity of the modern world and um i really high, highly recommend that people and their partners uh, they work together to try to create as a you know an alchemical place we can't we, we, we can't go to a cathedral. We can't go to the sacred circles all the time, but we can, you know, create a place within our house or our home that um, has that indwelling of the, of the telluric energies, which are build up in you and keep you um, healthy and, and happy. And, um, you know, uh, listen to uh, 432 Hertz music. Um, which is very rare, but you can get it on YouTube now. If you just type it in, you can find a lot of it. And that is the music that was played in the cathedrals. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it, we play four 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 zero hertz now because we were we are constricted by the engineering of the musical instruments. They can only do so much, but yeah. you can retool our instruments to play the four three two hertz, which is a sacred hertz. And I, I don't know if you know this, but there's actually music which is kind of outlawed by the sacred circles. It's a music that causes you to um, do bad things. It's called the dia diabolic, diabolic, and it's a, a certain progression of music which can cause mobs to go crazy and people to murder. And, you know, sort of, I hate to say it, but a lot of the diabolic uh, progressions are used in heavy metal music, which is funny because <laughs> it's associated with the devil. So, um, but it's basically, I don't want to, I don't want to play it because it's devilish, but it's, it's basically like, <laughs> this caught, it's sort of like the sirens in Europe on the, uh, on the police uh, sirens mm. in Europe, mm -hmm. ew, ew, ew. this disconcerting set of notes that causes you to go crazy, basically. Mm. And when um, they would capture prisoners like at Guantanamo back when W was the president and they were doing all that insane stuff, they were actually playing diabolique in the cells of the <laughs> prisoners, if you can imagine, all night long while they're trying to sleep. It must have been, you know. So anyway, um, you can, you can use these shamanic traditions in a bad way, is what I'm saying. Yeah. And so we have to be careful. So you have to live this like really pure life. It has to be, you know, no lying, no cheating, no stealing, mm -hmm. no hurting people. If they avoid all of those things, if you and 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 you have to do it all the time, even when your life is at stake. You have to do it. You have to not lie, even though you may get killed for telling the truth. You still have to tell the truth. And once you live this kind of life, you realize that nature imbues you with powers that you didn't have until you decided to live that life. And that is alchemy. That is alchemy. That is alchemy realizes that nature is a reflection of our personality. And whatever you are, nature will either cut you a break and cut you some slack or they will it will pounce on you and destroy you and yeah. you know it's a black and white version but it's a very real version you know mm -hmm. i'm i uh um i've had two encounters in my life i'm i'm a big huge hiker in the mountains i love to hike in the mountains especially in the in the spring and in the summer i've had two very close encounters with very large male mountain lions in which we were four or five feet apart on the trail looking at each other. And I never had any problem with them. They just looked at me like I was a nothing, really, um, kind of a pansy that they didn't really want to waste their time with. And they walked away from me. And I think that that's attitude. And I know in the shamanic traditions, they say you won't be attacked by an animal if you're cool. If you're understanding what's going on around you, you're not, you don't have to worry. You can walk through the woods unscathed. And I, and I really believe that. I really believe that it's all about your attitude and, and how you uh, approach the world around you because the world around you is a reflection of you. It is a mirror of you. You create your own reality. Hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's interesting too. So I, I've been a witch for over 20 years at this point in time. And one of the kind of the basics that we work with is the elements. And for us, there's five elements, earth, fire, water, uh, air, and spirit. And it's, it's something very simple, but I think just in modern day society, we forget how powerful those elements are and how they, they really do ground you and they can teach you so much. And I think it's just, it's a lesson that everybody would benefit from. And I'm glad to hear that there are people like yourself who are kind of out there telling people, hey, stop, take a moment, take a breather and go out in nature and, and really start to reconnect yourself back to that. Yeah, it's really important to work with uh, those uh, with the, the four main elements and of course mm -hmm. spirit or ether um you know every day you know yeah. work with water work with uh, uh, uh use sky ring you know put a bowl of water in front of you and just watch the waves and see mm -hmm. what happens to you i do this all the time uh work with fires i work with fires i have a pit outside my house and i'll i'll build a fire i'll just stare into the flames and drift mm -hmm. into other consciousnesses the same with earth and air you know, it's interesting in modern day physics, they tell you that there's four states of matter. Mm -hmm. They say there's solid state, there's a gas state, there's a liquid state, and there's a, 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 a plasma state. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you go into uh, alchemy and you look, you realize that they're saying there's four states of matter. They're saying there's earth, which is solid. They're mm -hmm. saying there's air, which is gas. They're saying there's water, which is liquid, and they're saying there's fire, which is plasma. Plasma is fire. It's electricity. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, invisible. It's just like they say in alchemy, it is the fire that does not burn. So plasma is a fire, but it doesn't burn you. And then, of course, we know that these four elements together make up the ether or the spirit, which is the ocean that we swim in, that we don't see. Mm -hmm. and um, And so... Um, we can see that the ancient alchemists were right with the modern physicists in, in their view of the nature of reality. They were just describing it in more basic terms that made sense to, you know, the people they were teaching and, and to themselves. Whereas mm -hmm. the physicists can now take a more ab abstract term like solid, which is, does not mean just earth, but it means anything that's, you know, hard. Like my yeah. table. So, um, so the, the physicists will never give us a break and say, well, yeah, you know, you guys were pretty damn close. I got to tell you. So, yeah. you know, you can't accept that. We're never going to get that. We're just, we, we cannot ever bring the scientists along with us. In fact, it's almost a mistake to think that they're ever going to join us because they're not. Because mm -hmm. the, the spiritual view of the world is way different than the materialist view of the world. So mm -hmm. I like to say that people right now who are not getting, you know, the thing, right, they are, tend to be more spiritual. They're, mm -hmm. they're more accepting of death. They understand that there is going to be an end. There's nothing to worry about. Everything's going to be cool. But um, so they're not afraid. Mm -hmm. Whereas materialists, they think this is all there is. So when they see what's going on right now around us, the things that are infecting us and things, they're terrified. They're mm -hmm. absolutely terrified. Now, during 2020 uh, 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 was probably the best year for me for travel in the United States ever mm -hmm. in my life. I literally, yep. I went to Sedona. I got a place that was $500 a night for 125. I got a place on the beach in San Diego that was normally 450 bucks a night. I got it for hundred dollars a night. I thought I was in heaven. I went to yeah. uh, Pacific beach in San Diego. There was like 5,000 people there on a Saturday, 80 degrees out. Usually there's 50,000 people there on the beach. And so, you know, I, I was having just the greatest time of all because I mean, I realized, you know, yeah, I might get sick. Um, I, maybe I will, maybe I won't, but I'm certainly not going to sit in my house worrying about it. And, you know, I went out into the world and although I think I had COVID in March and April of 2020, um, I didn't really get that sick from it. I just had some, you know, nasal problems and things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, fear is also a huge part of this whole thing. How yeah. if, can you walk? in nature unafraid 
And if you can, then you probably can walk anywhere unafraid. So that's the other thing about this is fear and how the establishment and the cabal is doing everything they can to instill fear into us so that we're just walking around terrified and mm -hmm. there's nothing to be terrified of. There's no such thing as death. You go into another realm mm -hmm. that's much more easy to live in than you do here. I've been there. I've had my own NDEs. Oh, um, wow. You know, I, 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 I'm not looking forward to death, but I'm not afraid <laughs> of death. I'm not looking forward to suffering, but I'm still, you know, ready to do whatever it takes. And I think that's the difference in attitude between us in our community and the other communities is that we don't have that fear. And so we can kind of walk through the valley of the shadow of death and we don't really give a damn. Mm -hmm. And it feels great. And um, so that's kind of my view on all of that. I think we're, we're, we're um, uh, the agents, the archons, the agents of fear are spreading fear everywhere now. They want everyone to be terrified. And um, I'm here to tell you this actually nothing to be afraid of at all mm -hmm. every anywhere on this entire planet it's cool yeah, We're fine. yeah absolutely fear is no way to live no um open-minded clarity has a question for you does jay also recommend combining 432 hertz with 528 hertz music during meditation definitely that has the greatest way if you can put a one on one ear and one on the other you get yeah. this crazy cross thing going in the center of your brain which um really the calmness that comes from it is amazing you know i what i like to do is i go to um near my house i have a um deep underground hot springs oh, nice. that come and i go there and i put on exactly that kind of music and i just lay there in the in the hot water and i, I swear to god it's the most transforming experience there's no drug that i've ever mm -hmm. taken that could ever achieve it and I'm calm for like three days before I go back again. And, wow. um, you know, so I, I, yeah, I highly recommend that. Interesting. Now, uh, I know obviously like sound has a huge effect on us. Do we know what these different um, frequencies do to us in particular? Or is it just that we know over time people have found that they heal us in some way or another? No, we know from cymatics. I, I don't know if you're familiar with cymatics, but the, in the cymatics, they vibrate a plate with different mm -hmm. uh, frequencies and different geometries form. And we yeah. know, I believe, that the 432 generates the Sri Yantra ge mm -hmm. geometry. So we know that these sounds have special sacred geometric forms that are, that are created. And those geometric forms, the thing about sacred geometry, which is really so important is that it proves that there's some kind of divine creation going on here and i think that's why it should be studied because you know once you understand there's some kind of intelligence behind creation and i i don't profess to know what that intelligence is i just mm -hmm. look for the evidence and i find it then i know and you would know that you know, it, it, it's a lot bigger than we think it is. The whole thing is a lot bigger than our pea right. brains can ever come up with. And, you know, that's sort of what, like, Zen is. Mm -hmm. The Zen, you go to, the, I went to the Zen, a Zen uh, monastery for like five years in my 20s. And for the first four years, I had no idea what was going on. I would be meditating and they would whack me with a stick and I'd be, why am I, I'm silently meditating here and you're whacking me with the stick. You're telling me all these nonsensical koans, which I have no idea what you're talking about. They make no sense at all. And I thought, you know, this is, you know, this is the biggest con job ever, or I'm a stupid person. And then about the fourth year uh, of getting hit in the head by, by a stick by my Zen master and having them all laugh at me when I said I didn't understand what they were talking about. I got it. It's a mind trick. It's a mind trick to teach you how to live with the contradictions of this reality. So everything in Zen is contradiction. They'll tell you a story and then you'll go, well, what was that about? But if you actually think about the story, it's telling you that you are lost in a contradictory universe there's nothing you can do about it except sit and be quiet and learn to just live with it. 
because there's, you can't do anything about it. There's nothing you can do. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the Buddha, again, is the same way. The Buddha said, you know, screw it. I'm going to sit under a Bodhi tree and, and meditate and be quiet because there's nothing I can do about any of this madness. And yeah. so Zen and Buddhism and even um, the teachings of Jesus are designed to um, help you uh, live in a world of contradiction, confusion, and violence. Mm -hmm. And how to avoid a lot of that, too. Absolutely. I, I'd say I have a modern day uh, version of describing that. I say I, I never listen to the news anymore um, because, I mean, what's the point, honestly? But I when my kids, I was talking to one of my my daughters the other day about this and she's just like, the world is just so crazy. And I was just like, it'll pass. It always does. It'll become yeah. something new. Get some popcorn, sit back and watch. That's all you can really do. You know, and th there are so many people that get so worked up about it. And I'm just kind of like, it's going to pass, guys. It always does. You know, it'll be something new. But you just sit back and watch that go, too. Yeah, well, we're in a, a very um, static point in history right now. We're in the fourth turning. And so um, uh, everything becomes, you know, hitting each other. And everybody's politicized. Everything is politicized. Right. And uh, you can't get away from it. But that will pass very soon. We're, we're about... We, we went into the fourth turning in about 2008 during the financial crash. Uh -huh. And uh, we've been in it now for, what, 13 years or so. And it's going to be another five or six years before it burns itself out. But it, it will burn itself out. And we're kind of going to be a little embarrassed at the end of it. I think we're going to go, whoa, I said some things <laughs> I shouldn't have said. And people said yeah. things to me that probably they are embarrassed about. And, and maybe we all ought to have a big hug and say, you know, I really <laughs> didn't mean to say that back then. It was just caught in the moment. And uh, I really think that's actually what's going to happen. Um, we sort of had that happen to us in the 80s mm -hmm. uh, after the 60s and the 70s brought on all this disruption and chaos then in the 1980s, late 1980s, we kind of went, that was kind of embarrassing. You know, um, <laughs> yeah. they weren't really fascists. We were calling them fascists, but they weren't yeah. really fascists. And, you know, we called them all these names and they really weren't those. It was just we were young and petulant and judging older people for what, you know, they had no control over what they were mm -hmm. part of anyway. I mean, mm -hmm. we're all, you know, how do you? You, you're born whatever way you're born, you have no control over it. So, yeah. you know, it's really a time now to really practice tolerance against your fellow mm -hmm. human beings. And when they say something stupid or really dumb or actually even that could cause someone to do something violent, you need to point it out in a very gentle way. Say, hey, you know, you should think about what you're saying there. You're not mm -hmm. really helping the situation. We, we're not, we, we don't need to have you saying something that may cause violence and yeah. um and we need to start that right now because right now we're just saying everything the internet has like unleashed all of our bad uh juju and and we're saying yeah. things i guess just today i was involved in a uh internet uh thing and people were calling me all sorts of names and i was like you don't even know me i you know, know it's you know? crazy yeah, you can't like, say anything without well, offending someone. And then they well, just rake you over the coals for it. It's crazy. And, you know, they're telling me at the end, they were telling me I wasn't even me, that I was somebody else. And that <laughs> and I was like, what? And, and, and so, you know, th that's really where we are right now. And yeah. the mature ones of us, spiritually mature people, we've got to take the lead. This is now our time to take the lead and to tell everybody to just cool their jets that this is not where we want to go. You mm. do not want to lose America. You do not want to lose this country. I've been in every country on earth almost. I guarantee you this place is extra special. It's mm. one of the most spiritual places on earth. I know you don't believe that, you who have not traveled. But you who have traveled know that I am right. And you know that you kiss the ground every time you come back here, flaws and all. Mm. So... You know, we are on the cusp of losing everything because a few people don't understand the nature of what the United States is. The United States is all the renegades of the world have come here. 
all of the people who were rebelling, who didn't want to live under the BS of the systems that they came from, whether it be in the Arab countries or Europe or South America or Australia. They, uh, they don't want to live in that anymore. They want to come to a place where we don't have these um, ancient uh, 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 vendettas against each other. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and so... I, 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 we don't want to lose this place and we're yeah. on the verge of losing it. And I think we should look back, take a step back and go, do we really want to lose this place? Do we really want to give it into uh, people that we don't know monsters that we have never dealt with before? Isn't it easier to deal with the monsters that you know, than the monsters that you don't know? And it is. So we know yeah. who the monsters are here. We know how to take them out and we're not going to do it violently. We're going to take them out through subterfuge and information. And we, we don't want any new masters. We want to deal with the masters we have now and, and then slowly disintegrate them and to create a more equitable society. But we mm -hmm. don't want foreign people to come in here and take over. And that's what we're, we're on the verge of that right now. And those people, they don't think like us and they don't mm -hmm. act like us. And we better be really careful what we're hoping for. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. You know, right now, even especially with the younger generations, like I hear um, my kids, not not quite so much, but certainly their friends are just their generation and they're all 18 and under. Um, there's so much bashing of our country right now. And it's it's incredible to me. And I like you have traveled a lot. My dad was in the military, so I grew up all over the world. And yeah. It's while there are amazing and wonderful places all over this world, there is definitely the U.S. has a very specific feel to it that, that it isn't anywhere else. And I think in part it's, yes, of course, it's it's the freedom that we have in this country, but it's also because it's such a blending of so many different cultures that okay. it just creates this amazing, beautiful culture of its own by integrating all of these others. And so it's always sad to me to, when I hear people, and, and again, I'm going to be the first to say, of course we have issues in our country. Of okay. course we absolutely do. But at the same time, I think you're right, and people aren't seeing the positives quite as much as they, they should be looking at it as well. Well, I think they're just not traveled. They're not well traveled. Yeah. You know, Mark that's Twain true. said, beware of travel. It removes prejudice and ignorance. <laughs> and I think that that's exactly right. You know, the more I traveled, the more I realized when I got back to America that, you know, there was something really special about this place and that people, I don't know, they walk different. They seem more... <sighs> I don't know, vibrant and uh, vitality, have a lot of vitality that uh, people in the other worlds don't have. And we don't have these vendettas that have been going on for yeah. thousands of years, which they have in the Arab countries and the South American countries and, and in Europe, too. I mean, in Italy, uh -huh. man, you go to, you go to uh, Italy and most of, it's still they're carrying out vendettas against each other for a thousand years. So huh. and I love Italy. Don't get me wrong. No. I'm a huge Italian uh, file and French file. And I, I love yeah. Italian food and Italian people and all that. I go there frequently. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I just think that, you know, we're, we're at that place where the, um, uh, I would say, I don't want to say they're losers. They're people who society has not granted them to be winners. And they've gone into the teaching professions and things like that. And they're kind of teaching their loser attitudes to our children. And what's interesting about that is that the women are beginning to figure this out. And they're beginning to attend school board meetings and all of this stuff because, um, okay, so I want to, I want to use this to, uh, as a teachable moment. All right. So, there's only two genders, but there's at least four sexes. Mm -hmm. It's very important to understand. Sex is not gender alone. Right. Sex is gender and psychology or soul. Because psych means soul in Greek. Mm -hmm. So you can have, we really have four sexes. I mean, there's probably more, but four basic mm -hmm. sexes. It's the male within the male which is a psychology and a gender. Mm -hmm. Then we have the female within the female, which is again, psychology and gender. Then we have male within the female. 
-hmm. and the female within the male. And so what we have today is the emergence of the last 2000 years, we've had the emergence of first, the woman within the man, Mm -hmm. which gave way to priesthoods. And this is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I'll get into this, but this is not a bad thing. I'm just telling you how to define reality so you understand it. And now in the last few years, we've gone into the man within the female, the Angela Merkels and the Hillary's and the Kamala's. This is the emergence of, again, it's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. So I'm not putting any judgments on this. So we have... We have the four ages of the four yugas, right? And in the Golden Age and the Silver Age and the Bronze Age and the Iron Age or the Kali Yuga. And um, each of these ages is go- governed by principles. And these principles say the uh, Golden Age was ruled by the women within the women. It was just hundreds of thousands of year long matriarchy in which we didn't work because there was plenty of food everywhere. We just wandered around and talked to each other and played music and loved each other. And, and there was no war. It was just this kind of a, a very pleasant. And we remember it in our heads down in our, in our central psyches. Remember that there was once a golden age where everything was really, really, really nice. And time just seemed to go on forever. And, you know, when we died, we weren't afraid of death. And it was this wonderful age. And then it slipped into the Silver Age, which was the male within the male. And so now we're in an age where the male within the male begins ruling. And they, uh, this is the age of warriors, emperors, uh, pharaohs, wars, hunting, because the women within the women's age, the Golden Age was a vegetarian age. But now we were switching into meat eating for various different reasons. Okay. And again, we, we had to do it to defend ourselves against certain things that were happening. Uh, And I'm not chastising the men within the men or the Silver Age, but it was an age where war began and we kind of descended until at the end of the Silver Age, the world was beset by bands of roving, armed, violent alpha males who were coming into villages and attacking and killing and raping and stealing. And finally, the women within the men decided that they'd had enough of the men within the men. And so they began building cities with walls to keep the roving bands of males out. They began creating religions. They began creating laws. They began creating a set of circumstances that would stop the roving bands of wild alpha males from attacking people by making it inappropriate. That you can't, this behavior is no longer appropriate. You need to stop it. You need, you can't beat your children. You can't rape the women. You can't kill people here and there. You, we have laws that stop them. This was created by the women within the men. This priest class that started around uh, Greece time, Greek ancient Greece time. That's when the when the Silver Age ended, and this Bronze Age began of of laws that would stop the males from uh, wrecking the place, wrecking the countryside, which they were doing. So then, this carried forth all the way uh, until recently. We now moved into the Kali Yuga, which is governed by the men within the women. Now, the men within the women, um, the group they hate the most is the men within the men. Okay, they really hate that group more than any other, and they're blaming them for everything that's going on in the world right now. All of the sorrows, all of the hell, everything was brought on by this one particular group, and they pretty much, you know, they're not saying it outright, but they need to be wiped out, pretty much. And so, you know, if you're a man within a man, like I am, you know, you realize that, you know, you better shut up or you're going to be in serious trouble here because they're going to come after you. And so, you know, I tell all the men within the men to withdraw, withdraw right now, just get away because the war is going to be between the women within the women and the men within the women. That's where that war is going to go. The men, women within the women who were supporting the men within the women up until recently, 
they supported what they wanted. And, you know, I'd support feminism and getting a job. You, you should not be held back because of your sex for getting a good paying job and all of that. But um, what's happening is, is that the men within the women um, have a, um, uh, they don't have the same feeling towards children that the women within the women have. It's a different feeling. They don't have that uh, mama bear attitude about protecting children and keeping their innocence as long as possible and all the things that the women within the women and the men within the men want. But the men within the women and the women within the men don't share those values. And that's where the rubber is going to meet the road here. Um, and so now you're seeing the rebellion of not the men within the men against the uh, men within the women, but the women within the women fighting back now against the men within the women saying, wait a minute, you're going too far here. You know, uh, again, I have nothing, no, no problem with someone being transsexual. If you want to think that you're a woman or you want to think you're a man, I know that there's four sexes. So I know that your feelings are correct. You really are a man inside a woman or you really are a woman inside a man. I totally and completely respect that. And if you want to, you know, take your body and, and go into surgery and take hormones and all that, I highly recommend against it because I think it's a trick of the pharmaceutical companies. But if you want to do it, I absolutely say you can have every right to go ahead and do it. But when it comes down to... Um, um, uh, like women's sports, then I think that the men, the women inside the men who are competing in women's sports, you know, dudes, you gotta, you gotta give it a break there, man. You know, the, you're going to win because you're physically a man. So, you know, you're, you're stronger, you've got much more upper body strength and everything. Uh, I don't care what you choose in life, but you're making a mockery of all of it when you do that. And that is a problem for me. So I'm totally tolerant for what you're doing and what you're feeling. And I realize you really are what you say you are. You have no doubt about it. And I wish society would accept that you are what you are. But I think when you then go out and lift weights in the Olympics and win all the gold medals and then go swimming and you're 38 seconds ahead of the next participant, I mean, come on, that's, that's just not fair. And, and so that's where I go with that. Wow. That's a lot to unpack. <laughs> yeah. So, so are, are these, um, I, I guess like the different ages that you're discussing, is this something that's written about in any uh, kind of ancient text or ancient knowledge? Where did this knowledge come from? Yeah, it's written in the Vedic texts. They talk about the four sexes mm -hmm. and the ancient alchemy texts of uh, India and also China and China. They're very accepting of, of four sexes. Mm -hmm. Um, when um, I can't remember the name, uh, Captain Perry first uh, landed in uh, Japan. Uh, he was taken into the royalty and they treated him great and everything. And and the first question they asked is, what, what, what sex are you? And he said, well, I'm a man. And they said, no, 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 I know you're a man. We can see that. But what sex are you? Huh. And, they, and he didn't understand it. And he said, well, would you like us to bring you a, 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 a man to sleep with you tonight or a woman? And he's like, well, no, I want a woman. What are you talking about? Goes, We're trying to find out what sex you are. Right? And, and he's like completely baffled by the whole thing because we don't teach this in the West. You know, yeah. we don't teach this, that, that sex is driven also not just by gender, but by psychology. So you have the right wingers who think it's all gender. And of course, the scientists say it's all gender because they're not going to move away from the part about psychology, but we all know that sexuality is part psychology. It's mm -hmm. part soul. We all know that. If you go to Nantes Cathedral in Nantes, France, there's a statue of an old man on one side and the same body, one body, but it has two faces. One is an old man. The other is a young woman, mm -hmm. clearly indicating that there's this, you know, this by location of sexuality. And it may yeah. even be that, you know, I'm a man this lifetime, and next lifetime I'll be a woman. You're a woman, you'll be a man next time. It's yeah. it, you know, it's 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 not really that hard to understand. It takes a bit of tolerance. You have mm -hmm. to kind of shed your Judeo-Christian belief systems to mm -hmm. to accept this. But if you look around 
that's reality. I mean, that's what's mm -hmm. going on. And if they teach this in second grade, then we would just have all of this confusion for the young people would just disappear. They, oh, true. I'm a man within a woman. <laughs> I finally get it. Right. Yeah. Instead of thinking that they've been, they were born in the wrong body. You're mm -hmm. not born in the wrong body. You're born in the right body. It's your body. Go have fun with it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely an interesting concept to think about. And it's it's fascinating. I never knew that about China. That's amazing. That's kind of blowing my mind. Um, OK, so Russell has this question. I want to make sure I get to it. Uh, what percentage does Jay give to the theory that France is the real Holy Land? Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, um, I give a lot of credence to it, actually. And um, uh, if you look at um, the history of France or there was a, a, a group of kings called the Merovingians. And the Merovingians arrived right after, well, I'll, I'll precede this first. There's a little church in the south of France on the coast, mm -hmm. uh, which is the Church of Mary Magdalene. And if you go into that church, there's a boat, and there's, there's three people on the boat, and one of them is a woman holding a baby. And the church is dedicated to the fact that Mary Magdalene, who was a witch in Jerusalem that Jesus forgave and stopped him from her from being stoned, had his baby and moved to France to get away from the um, Rome uh, insurrection against the Jews. And of course, we know that uh, people in the Middle East would frequently go to Provence in the south of France in the summer to get away from the hot summer. So Provence is this really cool, beautiful, rolling hills and grapevines and beautiful houses and beautiful people. And the food is outrageously great. And it's just, I don't know, my favorite place maybe on earth. But um, so she arrived there and uh, Pope John the 23rd, by the way, dedicated this church and said it was a real church. <laughs> and um, she, and Merovingian means they who come from Mary, the kings who come from Mary. And Mary Magdalene created this incredible spiritual tradition in the south of France, an alchemical tradition. Okay, because the story of Jesus, maybe it's true that some guy came and died on the cross and all that. I'm not going to argue that. But if I, when I, okay, so I was raised a Catholic and I abandoned the church when I was like, whatever, 17. And then when I was like 40, I decided after studying alchemy for you know 20 years that I would actually reread the New Testament for the first mm -hmm. time and all that. Time. So I read it. And to me, it was an alchemical document. It had nothing to do with historical personages walking around the Holy Land saying things that were wise. To me, Jesus was Jesus was the um, the fire that is resurrected through alchemy and that Mary was the water. Mary means Mary or sea. Mary was the water. And uh, every one of the people in there was a different element of, of, of alchemy. And they were all combining to remake the world in a new way. And that's basically, you know, whether you believe that Jesus exists or not, you cannot deny the mythology seeked to create a world of forgiveness and, you know, turn the other cheek and the female within the male essentially the mm -hmm. the the male who had become more balanced in his sexuality and was not conan the barbarian running around the landscape raping and fighting and drinking and all the things that us males are known to do and so um uh you know we did need to be tempered this is the thing we did need to be tempered and 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 that's what that was about and and so um when I look back at, 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 at history of the Western religions, I don't see a savior coming uh, to save us. I see a process that if used correctly will save us. It's just that they made it personalities. They should never have done that. They do that in alchemy all the time, by the way. They'll huh. call somebody, you know, somebody a name, a human name, like a, an element will have a name. And they're doing that, you know, for various reasons. But the Christians began confusing the alchemical message of transformation with the idea that there really was a person. And there may have been, I'm not saying there wasn't, but right. a person who came and died on the cross. You see, in alchemy, 
to me, you die at the crux, which is cross mm -hmm. in Latin. That's okay. you die. You're you have a minor death. A um, what do they call it in French? A uh, petite petite morte. You have a petite morte. You have a small death. That's what you're looking for in alchemy. You're looking to experience the petite morte. So that when you come to the real morte, the real death, you're like, man, I've been to Switzerland. I know this place like the back of my hand. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so that's what that's all about. And that's what the story of Jesus is about. And so every year they would have the passion plays. They don't have many more where mm -hmm. everyone experienced the death, their mm -hmm. death through Jesus. And, Jesus. and so they, they became comfortable with death. And that is the beginning of the alchemical transformation of the human race is when we understand that death is just another stage of our spiritual existence. Interesting. Okay, so that so makes a lot of sense then. I'm not a Christian, but I do appreciate the sensibilities. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That makes a lot of sense, though. So then the, the death would be the petite morte, and then the resurrection would be kind of the knowledge that they, he, he has gained afterwards. You can come back. You will be yeah. reborn. Yes. Interesting. Okay. All right. Zach has a really fascinating question too. And I want to see your thoughts on this. Um, at Space Out Radio, how might these four sexes correspond to the four evangelists represented in the Zodiac, man, bull, lion, eagle, and in terms of the great year? Good question. So everything is um, in alchemy is broken up into, in, into quaternaries or quarters. Mm -hmm. So, um, they believe that um, that there's never two of anything. They believe there's always four. And then everything breaks down from there into other quantities. So the, um, the four sexes are definitely represented by the four um, signs. Of course, man would be the man within the man. And I believe that the um, uh, woman within the woman is the uh, lion. And the bull is the woman within the man, and the eagle, or also the scorpion, is the woman, the man within the woman. And so we are now um, moving into the age of Aquarius, which is a fixed sign, and it's the man. It's the only uh, sign that's actually a man, and the man with the water uh, uh, bottle. And so we're moving, and, and every time there's a fixed we move into a fixed sign, by the way, something really, really big happens to the human race. So, um, and again, that's part of the four of the great year. So every, the great year is 25,920 years. And so every 6,500, not really 6,480, I guess, is the real number, but 6,500 for government work. Every 6,500 years, we go into another fixed sign of the zodiac and now moving in to aquarius which is a fixed sign so if you go back 6500 years ago to the um, age of taurus you see the beginning of agriculture writing cities slavery war um uh, the women as chattel um uh, uh all sorts of things are going on that are just you know all at the same time it's incredible it's all happening all at the same time there's just like we're just coming up with all this stuff without anyone really understanding how it's all coming up at once because that's it's the nature of the age if you go back to another 6500 years you have the great um disaster of 13000 years ago when the comets hit the earth and we got thrown into the younger driest ice age where most of humanity almost died and we, we barely escaped alive. And finally a coronal mass ejection hit the earth, which uh, melted the ice and, and warm period came back and we were able to come out of the age of um, uh, Leo. That was the age of Leo. That's what the Sphinx is about. The Sphinx is marking the age of Leo, the lion, the age of the lion the age when things got really hairy. And if you go back 26,000 years ago, I mean, no, 18,000 years ago to the age of Scorpio, um, you have the emergence of, <clears throat> of um, painting 
and uh, you know, the, the caverns in France and things. And you see this kind of emergence of a new kind of thinking. Then if you go back 26,000 years ago, you're back to the age of Aquarius, which is the emergence of Cro-Magnon man and uh, the first highly intelligent Homo sapiens are coming around. And you can see that for whatever reason, the four zodiacal fixed signs are markers of big events. Now, the leaders of our world, the people at the World Economic Forum, they, they're woosters. They're into woo. You know, normies are not into woo, but you and I are into woo. Yeah. <laughs> and believe it or not, the leaders of our world, the real leaders of our world, mm -hmm. are really into woo. Mm -hmm. And I like to say, if you want to meet a, a rich, um, a, a guy who plays Wall Street who's rich, um, they're a dime a dozen. If you want to reach a guy who plays Wall Street who's really rich, guarantee it, he has an astrologer. I've known many <laughs> of them, and they oh, all wow. have astrologers. So, yes. um the 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 woo the people the, I call us woosters like roosters <laughs> I love roosters. it so yeah trying to wake everybody up right like roosters do but we're really woosters because we're trying to wake everybody up with woo yeah so the people that run this world are also woosters they know exactly what's coming down the pike here in the age of Aquarius and the coming mm -hmm. ice age and all of the things that are about to change the way we think. And they're trying to get ahead of it. They're trying to, they're to them, they're saying, if we can get ahead of this, we can still be in control of the age of Aquarius. Well, I got news for you. You don't understand the age of Aquarius and you don't understand us because ain't no way we're going to follow what you're saying. There's just, you don't understand us. We believe in spirit. We believe in life after death. We don't believe death is the end. So you can't do anything to us. You can't do anything. We are completely free of you. And you think the way you think that we are afraid, but we're not. And you're going to pay the ultimate price when you find out how unafraid of you we really are. Mm hmm Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. So we are already through the first hour, which is amazing. It has flown by. So we will take a quick break, a five minute break. Um, Red Cap has a great question that I'd love to maybe start with if you're up for it. What valuable spiritual knowledge can you share from ancient Egypt? So maybe we can talk about ancient Egypt when we get back. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jay. I will see and we'll see everybody in five minutes. All right, everyone. Welcome back to our number two, Spaced Out Sunday. I'm your host, Lynn Wallington, and thank you for being with us tonight. Don't forget that if you've missed portions of this show or others, you can check out the archives at youtube.com slash spaced out radio. Just do us the favor while you're there and hit that subscribe button. Also, if you're enjoying this show, please hit the thumbs up and give us a comment down below and also share. So people can come and enjoy it with us. Uh, thank you all for your generous super chats. Your support is what makes Space Out Radio possible. We can't do what we do without you. Our website is spaceoutradio.com, where we have a ton of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot. And don't forget to read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. All right, let me get Jay back for us, and we will continue with the conversation. Okay, welcome back, Jay. So everybody is really enjoying this conversation and we have so many good questions. So I'm going to see if we can get to some of them. Uh, so we'll start with Red Cap's question that we talked about before the break. What valuable spiritual knowledge can you share from ancient Egypt, if any? Um, yeah, so the, to me, the most important knowledge that I've gathered from Egypt is the knowledge of the afterlife. Mm -hmm. And that's what Egypt was more or less dedicated its entire uh, culture to, was the study of the afterlife. And they came up with this concept that there's um, three, there's more, but I'm just going to concentrate on three uh, <clears throat> energy bodies the human being has. Uh, one is the Ka, one is the Ba, and one is the Ku. And the Ba is the part of you that is um, spiritual and soulful, but it's embedded in your body. It's in your bones, it's in your skin, it's in your hair, it's in your fingernails. And um, this uh, spiritual uh, entity, when you die, um, it resides in that, in your body until you completely deteriorate. 
until your bones completely turn to dust and finally your ba can leave. This is uh, frequently what ghosts are. Um, they're ba's that are trapped in a, in a bad place and they can't get out of it. So they're, um, they, instead of dissipating, they don't, they stay around. And um, the, in, in India, they try to bypass this, um, this, this uh, ba by uh, cremation. Um, they believe that if they cremate the bodies, they can uh, uh, destroy the Ba right away so the Ba doesn't hang around. But it's kind of important. I, there's an argument in spiritual circles whether getting rid of the Ba too fast is a good thing or a bad thing. It may be that it's necessary for the Ba to kind of roll through the life over and over again and kind of learn what happened here. And so you may want to let natural processes take hold there. I don't know. I'm not going to judge it. The second body is the Ka. The Ka is the eternal body. This is the body that never dies and is eternal and is always on its way back towards the, uh, the light, the center of knowledge, the gnosis, right? And then there's the Ku. Now, the Ku is our astral self. It's always portrayed as a bird in Egypt. And the Ku is what flies from here and goes to the spheres that are around the earth. So there's these, according to esoteric lore, there's seven spheres or realms that go outside the earth. They go all the way to the orbit of the moon. In fact, the moon may be like a, an orbiting border guard to protect these spheres. And each sphere is completely different than the sphere before it. So one sphere is doing one thing, and the second sphere is doing another. They're each accomplishing different things for soul work. So when you die, you go to one of these spheres if you're a good person. Because there's also seven spheres below the earth where you go. I, I know that New Agers hate to hear this, but you actually, in Egypt, when you die, your soul is weighed, and if it's lighter than a feather, you go into the upper seven spheres, but if it's heavier than a, seven, a feather, you go into the bottom seven spheres. And I don't know if you know this, there's this, um, there's this a phenomena called... Uh, uh, Miners' voices were guys that work deep down in mines, like a mile deep, and like in South Africa in the diamond mines, they hear people screaming. Mm -hmm. They hear voices screaming, and they there's actually recordings of it. It's quite eerie, and no one, you know, oh, it's rock cracking against each other, and and maybe it is. I, I'm not going to say what it is, but it's just damn eerie. And yeah. then we got the whole version of hell. And of course, the further down you go, the more constricted and the hotter it gets. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not Christians that came up with hell. The Egyptians had a Hades. The Greeks had a Hades. All the spiritual traditions actually have it. I'm not concerned with those because I'm not going that way. I'm going up into mm -hmm. the upper realms. And I've already been there in my um, astral travels and things. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful up there. It's just absolutely incredible. And, um, so um, <clears throat> so the coup is what goes up there, and it learns its soul lessons. It you know, flies up like a bird, and it goes up to whatever realm it can get to. It tries, mm -hmm. oh, I want to get to the highest realm, but you're only, because the weight of your soul determines which plane you go to. So like um, people who have just discovered spirituality, you mm -hmm. know, and this is their first life that they've discovered it. They've kind of been automatons their whole 15 lives before, but finally in their 16th life, they discover that there's actually something here. They only go to that first plane. Mm -hmm. they only, and what they get taught there is, okay, you finally achieved it. You've now got there, but everything you know is wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, all that stuff you got taught in Sunday school, you know, it's got some of it right, but 90% of it is wrong. And we're here to straighten that out. And so when they get regurgitated and they go back, now they're more interested in, maybe Eastern thought or, you know, uh, paganism or other things, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, each realm is different. One realm, which I've been to, is a realm of this fantastic architecture that glowed. Mm -hmm. 
just it glows with lights and different colors and you can walk up these stairs and effortlessly by the way and go to this beautiful palaces of glowing lights and entities and you know i'm not i think that's like realm four and i haven't got beyond that but what other people have told me is like realm seven is like you know pure absolute amazing you know because if you hit realm seven you're on your way out you're on your way to the next the next deal, the next yeah. thing. So you you know you come back and until you bounce back like a ping pong ball from these realms to life to the realms to life until finally you get, if you're lucky, and you study when you're a human. The thing that's most important in this whole scenario is while you're here, you have to be spending all of your time working on your soul. That's the only thing. Making money is not important. None of it's important. The only thing that's important is working on your soul. And that's what the Egyptians taught more than anything. And Because you want to get to that seventh realm. When you get to that seventh realm, you're free. You can now move to larger, higher realms that are closer to the source. Because that's the whole goal is to get from where we are, which is a long way from source, to source. So I have a question then. So what about people like myself? Because I do believe that we've lived many lifetimes. Um, and I also believe that it's possible that we've lived um, what we would consider extraterrestrial lifetimes. How does that come into play with these sort of seven spheres? Well, it's because it's harder than just the seven spheres. Because mm -hmm. there, there's you, when we talk about the seven spheres, that's you. Yeah. The one we're talking to right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's more yous than you. Okay. There's there's a multi-dimensional you that mm. exists in other dimensions. And I can't I can't talk about that because I'm not in those dimensions. But I mean, I've seen the reverberating effects and the people who come back from that. And so I'm of this belief that I'm probably living 12 lives right now. In different time zones and different lives and different zones and different planets, different galaxies, and that I have an effect on those other 11 uh, J's. Mm -hmm. um, and that if I make the right decisions here, then those J's that are out there in the other dimensions, they begin to realize how they can make the right decisions because, really and truly, progress, soul progress, is about making the right decisions. Are you going to kill that guy or are you going to forgive him, right? This is, this is what it is. And are you going to go over there and beat the hell out of somebody or are you just going to walk away, right? Are you going to suck it up, right? Or are you going to go over there and do something crazy, right? So mm -hmm. that's what this is all about and learning how to, you know, negotiate your way through all these different realms. And, um, and we don't teach our children this anymore, that this is what we're here for. And so, yeah, I think that we're... Um, we're multidimensional, and, and these realms that I'm talking about is only for this dimension, only for yeah. this round. But I believe we're much deeper than that. You know, I'm reading um, uh, um, um, I'm reading a certain writer who's been around for 100 years or so, fiction mm -hmm. writer. And, and I'm not going to say his name or anything because I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea. But when I read this, I don't read fiction very often. I'm mm -hmm. mostly nonfiction. I want the facts, man. I don't care about, you know, <laughs> fiction. And yeah, um, But this one guy, I read his books, and I really feel like it's channeled. It's mm -hmm. as if this person really, truly did live in these fantasy worlds or they're not fantasy. They're real worlds that we think are fantasy. And that they're having a multidimensional experience. They don't know how to express it, so they put it down as a, as a novel, mm -hmm. whereas another person might put it down as a painting, like Alex Gray, my good friend, or somebody else might put it down as schizophrenia, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I'm having a schizophrenic experience, but you're mm -hmm. really not. You're just bleeding into these other dimensions. And so that's why... Um, I believe the human race and each human being is so important because there's so many multiplicity things that are going on. You didn't get here by accident. It's all this kind of weird divine plan designed to um, create multidimensional wave effects across many aspects of the realms that we're living in. 
Absolutely. Um, okay, Grantavious, I'm going to get back to your question. Um, I just want to address this really quick because it's what we were talking about. So, I mean, I think I probably know how you're going to address this, but how do you, so our friend Low Pro is saying, still got to pay the rent though. How do you address that topic? Well, you do. And so you have to realize early on that, yeah, part of this life is going to be working. Part of this life is going to be struggle. And you have to accept it with a good heart. But, you know, it's a bitch, you know. And, um, uh, you know, I worked from the time I was uh, 10 years old until just two years ago. Is finally, I had no idea what not work was until two years ago. And I woke up and, and I had PTSD also when I finally retired from work because I did not realize how much stress just getting up and going to work causes you. Yeah. And when you don't have to do that, and then one day about a year after I finally retired, I woke up one day and I went, hey, I got nothing to do today. Wow, that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> I took on this different attitude like, wow, what a pleasure it is to have nothing uh, required of me today. And so, yeah, you got to get up and work and it's a bitch. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing is, is don't lose sight of who you are yeah. while you're going through that drudgery. Mm -hmm. And if you don't lose sight of who you are, it won't be drudgery to you. Mm -hmm. Look, when you go to work, make it an adventure. Um, there was a movie once with Johnny Depp and Marlon Brando where Johnny Depp was a psycho who went to a, a, a mental place and Marlon Brando was his psychiatrist. Uh, Juan, uh, Don Juan, I can't remember the name of the movie, yeah. but every day Johnny Depp, who was uh, you know definitely a mentally ill person, would come to see Marlon Brando for his psychiatry session. He would say, oh, one, another wonderful day or villa right and in his mind he wasn't in a psychiatric institution he was in a grand villa in spain where there were <laughs> horses and beautiful women and the food wasn't jello and bread it was you know gorgeous food and 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 he just you know it was a beautiful movie because he had repainted his reality i don't believe it was mentally ill at all that's what i would do i mean maybe i'm mentally yeah. ill but that's what I would do if I was in that situation. I would turn it into a fantasy, a wonderful, yeah. beautiful fantasy. And I, and I think that's what we have to do. We take mm -hmm. your drudgery and, you know, you got to you're working at McDonald's. Um, you know, uh, maybe take a second to get to know the customers. Mm -hmm. You know, they probably have some interesting stories. And, you know, I know yeah. life's a bitch and I know work is hell, but uh, we all have to do it except for the very rich. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just something we have to put up with. Yeah, absolutely. It's part of the, the learning that we do, I think, on this planet. Um, yep. okay. So Grantavius wants to know, would you have anything to say about the energy soul trap that is said to be around us when our bodies fail? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so the um, when you die, you're, um, you, you have a shishuma which is a hundredth the width of a hair. It's this energy plasma beam that connects you to the larger plasma field that surrounds the earth. And when you die, that shishuma, which goes all the way down to the back of your spine. Oh, nice cat. Uh, beautiful. <laughs> I used to have a cat look like that. And um, the shishuma begins collapsing in on itself as it travels up the spine. It's gathering up all of your energy and then it, shoots up through the shishuma into the larger plasma, taking you with it. So um, we all um, have this experience when we die. And um, you know what? I forgot the question. What was the original question? I had the answer coming, but I forgot the question when I got caught in the shishuma. It was the cat. He distracted you. The cat. Um. That's what did it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And, okay. So what happens is, is that um, there is this tunnel of light, which you will see, and you will go through this tunnel of light. And as you exit the tunnel of light, you've got some choices to make. Usually I hear, oh my God, you got a cute dog too. And usually um, you, you have angelic help by this point of some kind, some kind of beings come and they start assisting you and making decisions. 
And you can go towards this bright light or you can choose to go to these realms that I was talking about. My advice, and I don't want to, you know, this is just my opinion, don't go to the light. The Gnostics taught you not to go to that light, that that is um, the light soul trap, which disallows you to have a choice in your next incarnation. Whereas you go to the planes, the realms, you have a choice in who you're going to be when you come back mm -hmm. until you decide not to come back anymore. And that's super important. I mean, I know that I decided who my parents were going to be. And I mean, it was just, a, you know, the most perfect choice for me at that time in my soul travel to, uh, you know, have a mom that was a little bit crazy and to have a dad that was completely, you know, iron. And, you know, so I had to have those people around me in order for me to get to where I am. I and mean, it was a balance. And so that's what I say about the soul trap. There is a soul trap, um, but it's only for the um, inexperienced. So people will actually live a life here that where they gain nothing and they die and they go back into the wheel. And they go back to the light. They come back here. But eventually they realize that there's something more. And when they and, and that when that becomes a discipline, then they can begin to realize that light is a trap. I'm going to these realms that are right around the earth. You don't have to travel a long way. They're right here around the earth. They don't, they're not in outer space too far. They're not on another planet. They're right here. And this is where you work out your soul stuff. Interesting. So how does, because you always hear about, you know, the light, of course, so like that's kind of the stereotype that we hear of after we die is go to the light. So how does one travel to the realms? Do you just, is it simply one of those you think it and you go there type situations or is there an actual choice? Or well, first off, the, the trick and I'm trying to say this over and over again, and I'm not getting it clear. So I'm going to say it again. It depends on what you do here. So if you actually spend your time meditating and studying and praying and, 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 and realizing about these other realms, maybe you have to take psychedelics. I don't really care. Whatever your path is, okay, then that, that determines, you know, what, what kind of angelic help you get when you die. But if you don't do any of the work, you just work at a job all day, come home, get drunk, and watch TV – you're not going to get any angelic help. So the light's going to be the most beautiful thing you're going to see. So you're going to go for it. Well, the angels actually grab you and say, well, Jay, you are not that good, but you need to go to round one and uh, they'll help you out there. And they're nice people. And, and here they are. And or, Jay, you really did good on this round. You're up to, up to uh, realm four. And, you know, now you're going to see the beautiful cities and the gorgeous people and read all the amazing books that have been written for 10,000 million years and it's that kind of thing. And so you have to do the work until you do the work, until you have the awareness to see what's going on. You're not getting any help at all. Nothing's going to help you. They don't care about you. You're a, what do they call it, N -N 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 NPC, non-participant. Precipitating character is a video game term, right? It's the <laughs> people in the background that don't matter, right? Yeah. In the video game, that's what you're going to be. You hmm. choose. What do you want to be? You know, if you if you want to actually participate in your afterlife, you've got to do something right now, today, right now, this minute. You've got to start. You can't. Oh, next week I'm going to buy a book. It's not going to work. You got to do it now. Yeah. You know, okay. Yeah, that makes. That makes much more sense. Uh, all right. Ghost Dragons wants to know, uh, has Jay read the book of Enoch? And if so, his opinion. Oh, yeah. Of hmm. course. Um, yeah, I think we have, um, yeah, I think we have these entities that, you know, are trying to control us. And, you know, I call them archons. And um, I think you have to be highly aware of them. There are spiritual parasites that will grab onto you and, and suck your soul dry. And you that's why you can't lie and cheat and steal and all that, because that allows, that breaks down your soul barrier and allows these, I don't know what they are, parasites to get in. And they just get in and they start. I, Alec Dre has a great painting of these like insectoid beings, like, you know, giant, like this big, piercing into their, with their beaks. 
you know, into the body and, you know, like 15 of them on a guy. That's kind of what I think these are. Once you lower your barrier and the way you lower your barrier is um, um, hard drug abuse, uh, really being um, uh, 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 having a lot of sexual partners, um, uh, alcohol abuse, um, uh, uh uh, violence, uh, uh, you know, hating people. Uh, this is what this is what breaks your barriers down and allows these parasites to get in. That's why you kind of have to live a sacred life. It's like you're not living a sacred life because you're some kind of haughty uh, super individual who's better than everybody else. You're doing it for your own self protection. That's what this mm -hmm. is about. You know, um, you know, I, I even go to the extent. Oh, this is going to sound really weird. I even go to the extent where I even put my own urine all the way around my house, mm. a ring of it, right? And, and you know, of course, it keeps the animals away. I live out in the middle of nowhere, and that's really important to keep some of the wild animals away. But it also keeps the spirits away, the, the nasty spirits. There's all sorts of ancient rituals that are very useful, not just like burning sage, but a lot of things. And you should actually be studying those and practicing them and, and doing them and doing them on a weekly basis. It's like super important. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, yeah. And e even just, you know, e even just as witches, we have a multitude of things that, that we use too. salt based something, something as basic yeah. as salt is amazing for protection. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So know, I I'm, I'm being uh, attacked by a certain person who doesn't like me and they're using all this black magic against me and, mm -hmm. and they're using not just me, a couple of other people I know are all involved in this. And we noticed that every time there was a full moon, mm -hmm. we were getting attacked, psychically attacked. I was having nightmares. And, mm -hmm. and so I said, you know what, that's it. I'm done. You know? And I just, you know, two days before the full moon, I start my rituals and I continue them all the way through the full moon. And guess what? I'm sleeping sound as a baby now because okay. it's not having an effect. In fact, it's probably bouncing off of me and causing bad karma for them because I actually know what's happening to this person who doesn't like me. And I know that they're suffering from the bad karma ever since I started like bouncing their rituals back at them. I would never do that, by the way. I would never do a ritual designed to hurt another human being. Mm. Yeah. Barry, um, I don't know if you know this one. You probably do. Uh, you bury um, mirrors on the four corners of your property. And it does exactly that is to create a barrier mm. that bounces it back right at them. Really good advice. Yeah. Really good advice, um, actually. Okay. So Tammy wants to know, is there a way to tell if this is our last trip to Earth? Uh, that's a good question. Um, mm. I would say it would be um, by how much knowledge that you have gained both spiritually and physically. And did you act on that knowledge? Mm. Did you work at that knowledge? And if you did, and you did it very sincerely with love in your heart, I'd say you have a really good chance of being the last time out of here. That's what I'm trying to do this time. I'm just trying to forgive everybody. I'm just trying to, to uh, love and do as many rituals as I can that protect me and to get me through this because I really don't want to come back. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of done. I've been there. But then I've really taken this lifetime to learn about everything that goes on here. And that in the Vedic truth, that's what they say. The only way out of here is to become completely knowledgeable of everything that goes on here. Uh -huh. And so that in includes looking at the darkness, uh -huh. which is something that people don't understand. Right. So you know, my wife says, Jay is the brightest, lightest person I've ever met, and he's completely obsessed with the darkness. And I am. <laughs> Me too. I'm Me too. Yeah. 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 I'm totally obsessed with it. I want to understand it because uh -huh. I don't understand it. And so I want to understand why someone would turn to the darkness. And so, you know, I watch movies that are dark and I mm -hmm. read books that are dark and I'm not big into comedies. I'm not big into ro romantic comedies or anything. I watch something to, to elicit this kind of uh, feeling in me so that I can figure out what it is 
that drives people to the dark. And mm -hmm. um, and in that, I'm not afraid of the dark. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just, I'm not afraid of the dark. And I've, I've had extremely harrowing experiences in the woods at night where I live because it's really far away from everything. And there are all sorts of strange creatures running around in my woods. And I'm not going to get into that one. But, yeah. you know, I faced them and they're not creatures that we know about mm -hmm. and they're real. And um, I know that me not being afraid was a big uh, part of me surviving. Mm hmm. Absolutely. I completely get you there. Like, I am obsessed with demons, understanding demons, what they yep. are, where they come from, how they affect us. Because, I mean, they're fascinating. First of all, you know, way back in, I, I think it was uh, Sumerian times, they, they viewed them as almost like gods. They were, they prayed to them. Um, and so somewhere along the line, our view of them has shifted. And I just find that fascinating fascinating but that's that could be a whole other show in and of itself <laughs> maybe the demons uh, changed what's that or maybe the demons changed maybe maybe they got tired of us <laughs> um grantavius wants to know i'd like to know how many um he later corrected how many forms we take while bouncing through these realms that's that's an interesting question many. i think 12 I think that's what it is. I think it's like a, a dodecahedron. We're kind of like a living dodecahedron. So we have these 12 aspects to us. And, um, and you know, and uh, I think it was with Jane Roberts in the book of Seth. She talked all about this. She had the best um, view of this kind of interdimensional reality that we're living in. And um, I think that's what dreams are, by the way. I'm right now in a particularly, I have no idea why, but I'm in a particularly high uh, state of dreams for some reason mm -hmm. last few weeks. Where, and, and, and it's almost like I'm looking through the eyes of, of different entities and looking at different realms and different places. And I'm trying to figure out what I'm, what I'm looking at when I wake up. But I, then I, I realize oh, this is, these are other multi-dimensional aspects of, of myself. And I'm looking at them and they're live right now with me right now. And, and, you know, so there is no death. That's the thing that you have to understand. This is a big false thing that the uh, powers that be want to put on you. So you're terrified of everything and then you'll follow the rules. That's what they want. That's what it's all about. And they're just doing that to you. And, and once you realize that they're doing it to you, you can say, no, I'm done. I'm done with that. They've been there. And uh, it's time for you to go. And you kick him out. Absolutely. All right. So Grantavius also followed it up with something that hits on what you were just uh, saying. Do you believe that everything we can dream up may actually be real somewhere? Oh, yeah. Definitely. I don't mm -hmm. believe that there's anything like imagination and fantasy. I think these are bleed throughs from other realities. Any artist... And I'm an artist and I'm a writer and a filmmaker. And I can tell you, I've had my bleed throughs and I know there ain't no way that I thought that up. No way, you know, and uh, uh, any, I mean, I was reading an interview with Bob Dylan talking about one of his great songs, Desolation Row, which is a, a super fantasy song. And he said, I have no idea how I wrote that. The lines just kind of bled right through me and I just wrote it down and, because it, what, he didn't write it. That's not what it was. It was him seeing other realms. And all great art is that. Everything. All great art. And that that's why I like um, super beautiful art. Because what it does is it makes you, uh, it, you, you kind of travel to these incredible, beautiful realms that really do exist. And all around us, we just don't see them in our everyday drudgery. Absolutely. Absolutely. It reminds me too, even, um, and in this sense, I guess I'm thinking, and maybe this, this is strange to think of it this way, but I view him as an artistic scientist, but Nikola Tesla, he even said these ideas did not, I did not come up with this stuff. It was given to me, which I thought was fascinating. He's a fascinating character. He really is. And um, he studied a guy named Boscovich, who was also Serbian. And Boscovich was around in the 
I think the 16th century. I have his book back there behind me. And his book is all about, it's this incredible book, which I guess has probably been suppressed by Western science. But it's all about how everything is higher dimensional, high dimensional toruses. And everything, all atoms are this, all everything is this. And they, these are electromagnetically connected into um, so that your body is a series of, of um, higher dimensional hyper uh, spheroids that are all connected magnetically together to create you. And of course, we do that in technology by uh, artificially doing this. But Tesla really understood this. And he was trying to make a new science based on Boscovich's work. Um, but he was so far ahead of everybody that nobody got it because you see ideas travel through humans um, through four groups. Uh, the first group to get a new idea are the mystics, which is what Boscovich was. The second group to get an idea are the artists. So the mystics get it first, then the artists. The third group are the scientists, and the fourth group are the politicians. So this a new idea has to go, oh, sorry. A new idea has to go through these four different realms to actually come into our reality, which is politics, right? So um, the mystics will say that um, there's this overriding force in the universe which unites everything and it uh, creates um, unity within the universe. And the, but this unity is expressed through duality and opposites, right? That's how it works. So then everybody goes, well, what the hell is he talking about, right? Well, then the artist comes along and goes, you know, that's kind of interesting, you know, that that guy said that. Uh, I'm going to try to paint it. Or I'm going to make a movie about it. Or I'm going to make a poem about it, right? So they make a poem or a book or a movie, and everybody goes, wow, that was really cosmic. Um, uh, I really understand that concept. And then the scientist reads the book or sees the movie, and he starts thinking, hmm, huh, I wonder if there is this kind of uh, interlocking force. And so he starts looking, like Tesla did, and he discovers the ether or the electromagnetic plasma, which connects everything. 99% of the universe is plasma, by the way. So he, could, he so Tesla realizes that everything is electricity. Everything is plasma, not everything, 1% is it. But almost everything is electricity. Everything is plasma. And so he begins expressing this with these inventions, which are amazing. In fact, we're living off of them right now with our, our lights and our computers and everything. And then finally, the politicians go, oh, okay, well, maybe we ought to build power grids, right? And so then the politicians vote to build power grids, and now we all have electricity because of Tesla, because of Boscovich, because of Maharishi somewhere who wrote about, you know, the mystical forms of life long, long, long ago. And so that, that's how these ideas permeate down into society. So it's like super important for us of a mystical bent to express our ideas as clear as possible so that the artist can hear it and then, you know, create art around it. The scientists can see the art, realize that there is something there. And then finally, we can get our society changed through the politicians. I envision like a society, say, 200 years from now, you know, and this society is where all of our crappy houses and buildings have been torn down. Then we take all that stuff and grind it into new products, which are all sacred geometry. All the streets are round. We no longer have straight streets. Everything is rounded. Everything is curved and, 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 and multidimensional. All of our buildings have the ability to, to bring in the telluric energy so that we're always in a healing space. We're never in a building that's got forced air or glass and steel, which are the worst things in the world for a human being. Um, and, you know, and, and hopefully these mystical ideas will eventually 
because there's so many people like you now talking about them that we will eventually reform our society into this sacred society, uh, the golden age, ruled by the women within the women, you know, protected by the men within the men, but still tolerant of all the other groups and all the other peoples that live in the world. And um, that's the, the society I actually envision. And I hope, you know, I'm doing everything I can to hope and make it come true. Yeah, that would be amazing. Uh, I'm going to have to look up Boscovich. You said us his name. Is that what it was? Uh, Boscovich. B O S K O V. Uh, I'll find that. I'll, I'll, I'll send okay. it to you. Boscovich. Yeah. Okay, it's fascinating because when you, when you, Go you ahead. were talking about it, there was one day because I'm weird and was sitting around thinking about the Big Bang Theory and how it didn't make sense to me. And the idea like sort of came to me that I think the universe maybe is uh, a torus in shape. So when you said that, I was like, what? Oh, I've got to read this guy. <laughs> yeah, that's why he's so important, because um, I believe the powers that be read him and said, we got to suppress this guy mm -hmm. and not let his stuff out. Because remember, they're Woosters also. Yeah. So the, the Woosters are all on our fringe end where we are. And then at the very the leaders are also Woosters. So yep. that's the thing we have in common with them, even though they're using it for different reasons. And so Boscovitz is really the most important scientist probably ever. And nobody knows about him. No, it's amazing. All right. I'm definitely going to have to look him up. Um, Tammy wants to know if there's been damage to a soul, how can it be restored? Oh, that's easy. The soul is the easiest thing to repair. All you have to do is ask for it to be repaired. You've got angelic helpers and all sorts of spiritual guides. and mm -hmm. They want you so bad to listen to them. And you're not. And most people who have damage to the soul are not listening to their spirit guides. And it's super important to understand that. So imagine that you're in a major city and you're in traffic in a downtown area. And um, uh, you're, you're, you're jammed in traffic and you got an appointment in 10 minutes and you're not going to make it. It's super important. But your best friend is a window washer on the 82nd floor of the tallest building in town. And he can see the entire town. And you got, you're contacting him by cell phone. And he's telling you, oh, if you take a right on 2nd Street, there's no traffic at all, Right. That's kind of what the higher self is. And so the higher self is always there, but we're not listening to it. And after a while, when you no longer listen to your higher self, and that usually happens in your 20s when you're so busy with life, you can't pay attention to what's going on anymore. Um, it atrophies and it stops trying to communicate with you because it's actually broken hearted. And so you, your soul is broken but all you have to do is say, hey, I know I've been ignoring you. I know you're trying to communicate with me. Please help me. And it's not going to come in words. It's going to come in intuition. It's not going to, it's not going to, oh, yeah, uh, you need to change your job, right? It's not going to happen like that. It's going to be a feeling that you're going to get while you're at work one day when your boss is yelling at you and you're going, uh-uh, no more. That's it. I'm out, right? So, that's how it works. And so it's not this bludgeon. Everyone is waiting for that bludgeon to hit them and make them see what to do next. It's not that way. It's a series of messages and feelings and actions that happen to you all day long. And if you don't pay attention to them, as I like to say, if you have a synchronicity occur to you, bam, you better stop right there on the spot and go, wait a minute. Why did that just happen? Why did this coincidence just occur? That's what a synchronicity is. It's this incredible coincidence that just happens. When that happens, there are coincidences, but they're fewer than we think. And so when I call them synchronicities, and when the synchronicity happens, that to me is the universe trying to tell me something really, really important. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, let's see. We are getting close to the end. So let me see if I can get through some of these questions too, because they've got some great ones for you. Uh, Red Cap wants to know, is lucid dreaming not spiritual because you have control or the opposite? 
Oh, no, lucid dreaming is definitely spiritual. That is you in control of your life. That is a sign that you are 100% in sync. So um, what you really want to do is lucid dream in your life. That's the key to success in this world. So, yeah, you can lucid dream in your dream world, you know, where you know you're dreaming and you can make, I mean, I've had lucid dreams that were so hilarious where I was making skyscrapers and <laughs> building billboards to my loved one, you know, saying how much I loved her and all that. And, you know, it was all fun. But in this life, you can also lucid dream. That's what's the most important lesson I've ever learned in my entire life, that this is a dream and that if you realize this is a dream, then you can now lucid dream this dream and now you are in control of it and not the Illuminati and not the cops and not the sheriff and not the judges and not the teachers and parents and all the other things that are there to tell you what to do. You are in control and you, everyone listening to me, you can actually do this. This is scientifically verifiable. You can wake up tomorrow and you can decide what you want to be. Don't ask to be rich. That's a huge mistake. <laughs> decide to be happy. Decide that you want to have a family. Decide you want to have a husband. Decide you want to have a good education. Decide you want to be a great artist. Decide you want to be a great guitarist. Decide you want to be a great scientist. Just make your, deci your decision and then every day live that life. Live that life every day, and I guarantee you, within a very short time, you will start becoming exactly that. It is amazing, and it's scientifically verifiable. I've done it with hundreds of people. It's worked every time except for the stubborn ones that don't want to do it. You know, oh, no, I can't really do that. I can never be a great guitarist. Okay, well, then you're not going to be a great guitarist. Go on to your other dream, which is being a loser. So, um <laughs> So um, this is all scientifically verifiable. You are in control of your dream if you choose to be in control of your dream. I will tell you that if you decide to become in control of your dream, miracles will begin to happen. Hmm. Amazing. Now, so I'm going to ask, so you said don't ask to become rich. And I, I, I think I understand why you say that, but would you, would it be uh, along the same lines if you were to ask, like for me, I would sit there and say, well, I'd like to be happy and successful. Success isn't necessarily equivalent to rich, I would imagine, correct? It's just, no. I want to be successful in whatever it is that I'm doing. Yeah, that that's not being rich. Yeah. You can be a Colombian drug dealer and be rich and be pursued right. by the American Marines. Okay, so you're rich. Yeah, big deal, right? So... You don't want to be rich. What you want to do is, you know, like you, you want to be happy. You want to have a nice house. You want to have nice children. You want to have a nice husband or a nice wife or a nice partner, a nice job, um, a, hap a, a job that makes you feel creative, um, a job that is where the people are all nice to you and nobody's screaming at you. These are the kinds of things that you want, and, and, and they're easily achievable, easily achievable. And um, everyone that actually tries this finds out it works. Right. And But you have to do it every day. There's a discipline. That's the thing we're missing today in almost every endeavor of our life is because they're not teaching it in school um, is to be disciplined. You have to do it every day. It's something that, that is a mental um, warrior. You know, I, today I'm going to imagine my – see, what happened to me – was I was told by a rich person who is a billionaire this uh -huh. knowledge. Uh, he told me that he was a lucid dreamer. He lived his life as a lucid dreamer. And that he th he felt sorry for me and said, you know, you're, you're just caught in the dream. You're rushing down the stream, trying to grab the roots as they go by to stop yourself from, you know, going down the river. And I'm not doing that at all. I'm like in a boat and in a yacht actually on the river living my life. And I thought, wow, that's cool. So then I went home and I tried it. And I said, okay, well, I just want to be a good filmmaker. That's mm -hmm. all I really want to be in my life. I just want to be make films that people like. And, you know, if they're successful, that's great. If they're not, that's fine. I just want to make good films. 
and then it happened. And pretty soon I got a job and I was making films and, and I got everything I wanted. And, and because I did it every day, though, discipline is a major role in your spiritual life. Mm-hmm. It really is. Yep. Oh, absolutely. It's key, I would say. And yeah, that's why I think I the thing that people don't realize a lot of the time is they feel like if it's spiritual, it should come easily. And it doesn't necessarily. Yeah. You have to mm-hmm. absolutely be disciplined in it. Could be the hardest thing you're trying mm-hmm. to achieve, actually. I mean, it's much easier to learn how to fly a plane, to be honest with you. Yes, I agree. Uh, Ami wants to know, if we feel we are done on our last life, do we go directly to the realms or the light? <laughs> Don't go to the light. Go to the realms. <laughs> Your angelic beings will help you. If you're ready to get out of here, they'll take you to the seventh realm, which is the last realm at the edge of the uh, uh, moon's orbit. And you'll be able to get out of here. Awesome. All right. Julie wants to know any thoughts on John Hutchinson and the Hutchins Hutchins. I can say it. I can say it. Hutchinson effect. There we go. There you go. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> Hutchinson's a really interesting guy. And of course he invented all these strange uh, things, but what he's doing is he's rediscovering the ether, the plasma mm-hmm. field that lives around us. And um, we've actually had some discussions. With John, and um, uh, yeah, great work. I mean, because he's proving it, which is why he's being destroyed by the scientific mm-hmm. community. Because they do not, they actually believe that there is no ether. They're mm-hmm. trying to describe the ocean that we live in, while denying that there is such a thing as water. Mm-hmm. So it's very interesting to see them go to all these machinations to describe the world we're living in without describing the form and the substance which connects all of us. And Mm -hmm. Hutchinson's experiments prove that there's this ether. And I'm absolutely 100% convinced that this ether is every, I don't know if you ever studied the works of Barbara Brennan, but she studied all about how you can, you can create forces which can hurt or help people. Mm. Um, you're building up these etheric powers within your hyperdimensional body, and you can protect yourself with it. Mm. If you've um, never read Barbara Brennan, I highly recommend you read her books. She has illustrations, yeah. which are absolutely amazing. Awesome. I'll have to check it out. I have not, but that's, I mean, all about witchcraft is energy work. That's what it is. Oh, you will love her work. I mean, yeah. She's 85 years old now, and I don't think she can do any more interviews. I wish yeah. she was 65 so I could talk to her. Oh. I talked to her 20 years ago. We had some of the most amazing conversations I've ever had in my life, and nice. uh, she had a real, real, real guide for me in my life. Amazing. I will definitely check her out. Uh, Larry says, how do you contact your spirit guide? Ask. Just ask. Mm-hmm. Just say, hey, man, where are you? I know I've been mean to you and I've been ignoring you and I didn't even know you were there, but Hey, if you give me some help, I really need it. You know, because I just got fired and my wife left me and um, I'd like to see the kid, but I don't have any money. I guarantee you'll start seeing these obstacles start getting removed. Once you start asking for the help, I really mean that. I know it sounds weird, but it, it really does work. Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, Open-Minded Clarity has a a comment. Thank you, Lynn, for introducing us to Jay. Jay, you've provided me some clarity as I reach a crossroads in my life and have given me some things to work on moving forward. Positive thoughts to you both. That's so nice. Nice. Thank you. I really Um, appreciate it. Yes. Oh, this is an interesting question. Okay. Avi, and thank you, Jay, for that super chat. Um, Avi May wants to know, how do I get rid of a truly horrible self-imposed curse? Interesting. Ugh, those are those are the worst. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are the worst. Uh, again, discipline. You've got to do the. You got to discover the rituals that will get rid of that curse, and you got to do them every day. Mm-hmm. And you can't do it with any kind of anger towards the person that cursed you. I know that's hard because mm-hmm. I've been cursed, and you know, first thing you get is, oh, you were so angry that someone would come at you. But that's working into their magic. So you can't do that. You need to go, okay, you know, I'm just going to let it bounce off of me. I'm 
not going to let it hurt me. And I guarantee you that if you do protection rituals, you will protect yourself. It does work. Hmm. But I think, I'm, yeah, I'm, but I'm, I'm sorry. a self I'm sorry that you have this. But he's obviously asking for a self-imposed curse. So I'm I'm assuming maybe they mean it's something they're doing to themselves, which I would think Ooh. it would be even harder to get rid of because you have to kind of uh, overcome that mental hurdle that you're doing. Yeah, that could yourself. be. I, I'm not sure what that means, but yeah, that could be. I mean, like the guys that used to self-flagellate themselves mm -hmm. back in the Christmas wars. I mean, you know, why are you doing that? You know, yeah. and um, so that that is a uh, that's a conundrum that's a tough that's a tough nut to cook um i don't know what to say um except that maybe you need to forgive yourself because it sounds like you're maybe done something in your past which you think is really bad and maybe it was bad i mean we've all done bad things in our past and you know and you, you got to get out of it and and not go into that recursive cycle that you go through. Oh, I did a bad thing. Therefore, I'm a bad person. Therefore, I can't ever do good. And it's it's not true. You can do bad things and completely redeem yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you you said it perfectly, which is you you need to ask yourself, Avi, why, why are you doing it to yourself? Start there. Yeah. And when you find that answer, then learn to forgive yourself. And sometimes yep. that's the most difficult thing we can do is to forgive ourselves. It's a lot easier to forgive other people, I think, sometimes than it is ourselves. I think you're right. Yeah. I've had that with myself. So mm -hmm. I know yeah. you're right. I think we yep. all have. Absolutely. Jay, we are at the end of our time. I'm so all bummed right. because I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. It's been so good. It has been good and, and a lot of really good questions. And we got into stuff that I don't, don't normally uh, talk about, uh, very deep spiritual stuff, which um, for some reason people don't... Uh, want to ask me questions about more, mostly Stanley Kubrick and mm. Fulcanelli and all that other stuff. So it's been really fun. Really oh, fun. Good. I'm so glad. And all that other stuff is really interesting too. So we will definitely have to have a conversation about that. <laughs> Be fascinated. Uh, well, thank you so much, Jay, for coming on. Well, yeah. I know I've appreciated it. Everybody else has th really enjoyed it. Um, I've been watching the comments in the chat and they're all just, uh, just thrilled to have had you on here. Sounds good. And thanks. And nice to meet you. Thanks. You too. Bye.